Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Good morning and welcome to today's hearing, Oversight in Iraq and Afghanistan, Challenges and Solutions. I would like to welcome Ranking Member Tierney, members of the subcommittee and, and members of the audience and certainly our panel uh, for, for being here today. This is the sixth hearing addressing the accountability of taxpayer dollars in war zones. During this session, the subcommittee has examined a number of issues, including whether the State Department is prepared to oversee the surge in private contracting in Iraq, whether the State Department will be able to protect government employees and contractors in Iraq after the military withdraws, whether USAID and the State Department can accurately track reconstruction projects and account for their expenditures, whether those projects can and will be sustained by the host nations, whether the billions handed to the Karzai government under the direct, assistance program, direct assist program can and will be properly overseen, and whether the Defense Department is working to ensure the taxpayer money isn't extorted along Afghanistan's supply chain. In October, the full committee heard testimony from the Commission on Wartime Contracting about its final report. The commissioners alleged that between 30 and 60 billion dollars had been lost in Iraq and Afghanistan due to waste, fraud and abuse in the contracting process. According to the commission, this was due to ill-conceived projects, poor planning and oversight, poor performance by contractors, criminal behavior and blatant corruption. This is unacceptable and while some may agree or disagree with our engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan, it is universally unacceptable to waste taxpayer money. In each of our hearings, witnesses have described the success and challenges in the oversight and is in a complicated environment. Without a doubt, the task is difficult. However, it is critical that we get it right. Today, the Inspector's General community will share its perspective together on one panel. The IG community plays a pivotal role in the oversight of Federal programs. Their mission is to promote economy, efficiency and effectiveness in the administration of Federal programs and to prevent and detect fraud and abuse. Its duties also include informing Congress of any corrective action that it needs to be taken. In addition to Defense, State and USAID, the Special Inspectors General were established to focus specifically on efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Each of these offices is present here today. While they have produced noteworthy results, significant challenges remain. We will hear about those today. We will also examine potential solutions. Ranking Member Tierney has introduced H.R. 2880, which seeks to disband SIGR and SIGAR and establish a Special Inspector General for Overseas Contingency Operations. I understand that Mr. Bowen and the Commission on Wartime Contracting support this idea. I would like to hear the panel's view on that legislation and how such an office would interface with the standing IGs. Ranking member's legislation is a good beginning. I look forward to working with him and the agencies and the IG community to structure an effective solution. Before, ranking, before recognizing ranking, the ranking member, Tierney, I would like to note that the Defense Department, State Department, USAID and SIGAR will not have IGs in January. In May of this year, I wrote the President asking him to move without delay to appoint replacements. That letter was signed by Senators Lieberman, Collins, McCaskill and Portman, as well as Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings and Ranking Member Tierney. I would like to place a copy of this record into the record without objection. So ordered. To my knowledge, the President has yet to nominate any of these replacements, nor has he responded to this letter. I find that totally unacceptable. This is a massive, massive effort. It is going to take some leadership and some help from the White House. These jobs cannot and will not be done if the President fails to make these appointments. Upon taking office, President Obama promised that his administration would be, quote, the most open and transparent in history, end quote. You cannot achieve, achieve transparency without Inspectors General. Again, I urge President Obama and the Senate to nominate and confirm Inspectors General to fill these vacancies and without delay. I now like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Chairman Chaffetz, and uh, thank you all uh, for being witnesses here today and helping us uh, with our job. Uh, this hearing, obviously, is the culmination of a series uh, of hearings that the subcommittee and the full committee have had uh, with regard to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we have heard from the Department of Defense, the Department of State, uh, on the transition to civilian-led mission in Iraq. We have heard from the Commission on Wartime Contracting and suggested reforms to reduce waste and fraud and contingency operations. Uh, and we followed up with the Department of Defense to discuss 
uh, the investigation that we had started earlier on corruption in the Afghan uh, trucking industry. These hearings continue to highlight the challenge of protecting the taxpayer funds from waste and fraud in our operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. In fact, the Commission on Wartime Contracting found that billions of dollars have been wasted by agencies that have little capacity to manage their contractors or to hold them accountable. Even worse, billions of dollars more have been dedicated to projects that were poorly conceived and are unsustainable by host governments. These findings are consistent with this Committee's oversight of defense contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan. Last year, I led a six-month subcommittee investigation of a $2 billion Department of Defense trucking contract in Afghanistan. This investigation found that the trucking contract had spawned a vast protection racket in which warlords, criminals and insurgents extorted contractors for protection payments to obtain safe passage. A follow-up hearing held by this subcommittee in September showed that the Department has made little progress in rooting out bad actors who undermined our anti-insurgency efforts in Afghanistan. We know now that many of these bad actors continue to serve as U.S. government contractors. In response to these findings of billions of dollars in waste, fraud and abuse, the Commission on Wartime Contracting made a number of important recommendations for Congress to consider. One key recommendation in their report was the creation of a permanent Special Inspector General for contingency operations. As the Commission stated, no entity exists with sufficient resources, experience and audit and investigative capabilities to transcend departmental and functional stovepipes. Taking up this recommendation, I have introduced legislation that the Chairman mentioned that would establish a Special Inspector General for Overseas Contingency Operations. These efforts of the Commission, along with the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction and the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, have shown the critical importance of real-time oversight in our overseas operations. We need to preserve the unique capabilities of these entities in a single permanent Inspector General with a flexible, deployable cadre of oversight specialists. I urge my colleagues to join me in this legislation. And while that legislation is designed to address future contingency operations, this hearing is about oversight in Iraq and Afghanistan now. To that end, I would like to address recent findings by the Department of Defense Inspector General that shed light on some of the problems with one of our largest contractors in Afghanistan. That report reveals that the Supreme Group, the prime contractor on the multi-billion dollar Defense Department subsistence contract in Afghanistan, is under investigation for hundreds of millions of dollars in overbilling. I understand that there is now a criminal inquiry into sub, uh, Supreme Group's overbilling. These allegations raise significant concerns about the Defense Logistics Agency and their ability to properly manage those large-scale contracts and to protect taxpayer dollars from waste and fraud. They also raise concerns about the use of no-bid cost-plus contracts that are so common in contingency operations. As we speak, the Defense Logistics Agency is preparing to award a new $10 billion to $30 billion contract to provide food and supplies for our troops in Afghanistan for five years. So I would like to hear from our Inspectors Generals today about what more can be done to ensure that our Federal agencies are doing their job and properly managing the billions of dollars that are being spent in those two countries. I would also like to hear from you regarding what tools you have to ensure that companies who are caught overbilling the Federal Government for hundreds of millions of dollars do not have the opportunity to take even more taxpayer funds in the future. So I want to thank you all again for being witnesses, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. Thank you. Members will have a, an additional seven days to submit opening statements for the record. We would now like to recognize our, our panel. The Honorable Gordon Hedell is the Department of Defense Inspector General. Ambassador Geisel is the Department of State Deputy Inspector General. Mr. Michael Carroll is the USAID Acting Inspector General. The Honorable Stuart Bowen is the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. And Mr. Stephen Trent is the Acting Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative. In order to allow proper time for discussion, we are going to ask that each, uh, each, member, or each uh, member of our panel uh, limit their verbal comments to five minutes. Your entire statement will be inserted into the record. I will now recognize uh, the Honorable Mr. Hedell for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Pardon, please. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, and good morning, uh, Ranking Member Tierney uh, and distinguished uh, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you to discuss oversight efforts in Southwest Asia. As many of you may be aware, 
This will likely be my final testimony before Congress as the Inspector General. Effective December 24, I will step down as the DOD uh, IG. In my first month alone at the DOD IG, I testified three times before Congress. Two of the three hearings dealt with critically important issues of oversight contingency operations in Southwest Asia, noting that our Nation was engaged in two wars and that we had a pressing need to strengthen oversight to protect our warfighters and the American taxpayer, I immediately determined to make oversight of contingency operations in Southwest Asia a number one priority. As a result, I instituted a number of organizational changes to the structure and focus of DOD IG efforts and to increase our in-theater presence, which is regularly augmented by our expeditionary teams. I believe strongly that an in-theater presence is absolutely essential to conducting oversight of operations and engaging with military and civilian leadership in theater to ensure that our oversight is meaningful and effective. In our Audit Division, I created the Joint and Southwest Asia Operations Directorate and the Afghan Security Forces Fund Group. Our audits in theater provide timely and relevant oversight, and our auditors now have extensive experience in conducting complex joint audits with other Federal agencies. In our Investigations Division, the Defense Criminal Investigative Service, DCIS, expanded its presence in Southwest Asia and today DCIS plays a major criminal investigative role in Southwest Asia by participating in key task forces that tackle complex fraud cases. The DCIS is already deployed worldwide and has the capability to immediately provide investigative resources to contingency operations anywhere in the world. Another division of the DOD IG, the Office of Special Plans and Operations, or SPO as we call it, has been a key contributor to providing oversight. SPO has significantly enhanced our capability to provide expeditionary teams to Southwest Asia to conduct timely evaluations and assessments and to provide thorough outbriefs to field commanders enabling them to take immediate corrective actions. I also appointed a special Deputy Inspector General for Southwest Asia to coordinate and deconflict oversight efforts. My special deputy has worked extensively with all of the IG offices represented with me this morning. Today we are an agile, flexible, no-nonsense and aggressive organization, oversight organization, with a capacity to deploy rapidly anywhere in the world on short notice, and the DOD IG is prepared to respond effectively and aggressively in coordination with other Federal agencies and internal DOD oversight offices to address any future overseas contingency operation that arises. I would like to thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to discuss the work of the DOD IG, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again for your service and your long career in, in uh, the Secret Service and, and your work in the Defense Department. We appreciate your service and, and wish you nothing but the best. We will now thank recognize you. the Honorable uh, Mr. Geisel. Thank you, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today about oversight of Department programs in Iraq and Afghanistan. Since standing up its overseas offices in 2008, the Office of Inspector General, OIG, has conducted 31 investigations and issued 27 reports related to Iraq, conducted 14 investigations and issued 22 reports related to Afghanistan, and issued 11 reports of activities affecting Department program and transition issues in Iraq and Afghanistan. Our efforts during FY 2011 resulted in more than $200 million in question costs and funds put to better use, $16.6 .6 million in investigative recoveries, and 20 contractor suspensions. 
These results demonstrate the impact that OIG has achieved since establishing a presence in Baghdad and Kabul. As a result of congressional support, OIG has fulfilled its commitment to vigorously oversee the Department's transition and soon will be one of the few remaining oversight entities in Iraq. The challenges the Department faces in the transition to a civilian-led presence in Iraq are significant. DOD's planned withdrawals of its troops by the end of this month requires that the Department of State provide security, life support, transportation, and other logistical support that DOD presently provides in Iraq. Our Office of Inspections has issued two reports, a July 2009 inspection of Embassy Baghdad and an October 2010 compliance follow-up review, which addresses the Embassy's transition planning efforts. In response to our CFR, the Department appointed a Washington-based ambassador in February 2011 to manage the Iraq transition process. We also issued reviews in August 2009 and May 2011 of the Department's efforts to transition to a civilian-led presence in Iraq. Both reviews found that the transition was taking place in an operating environment that remains violent and unpredictable. Our October 2009 report on the Department's transition planning efforts recommended that Embassy Baghdad develop a unified transition plan and assign a senior transition coordinator in Iraq, establish a workforce plan to ensure timely completion of large infrastructure projects managed by the Embassy, determine what log cap services and contract management personnel would be required, and verify resources needed to meet increased support requirements following DOD's departure. All of these recommendations have been closed. Our May 2011 report noted that Embassy Baghdad and the Department had established planning and management mechanisms to effectively transition to a civilian-led presence. It also mentioned that while the Department had made progress, several key decisions were pending. Some transition planning could not be finalized, and progress was slipping in some areas. We remain concerned that some reconstruction projects were still experiencing delays and were not expected to be completed until mid-2012, and that establishing a viable diplomatic mission without DOD support and funding would require considerable resources, making it difficult to develop firm or detailed budget estimates. The Department generally agreed with and was responsive to the intent of the recommendations. Looking forward, we have 15 investigations related to Iraq and nine related to Afghanistan. Our 2012 Iraq and Afghanistan oversight plans include six audits plus a proposed joint audit with DOD OIG of programs in Baghdad and Kabul. In Baghdad, we will look at the Worldwide Protective Services WPS contract for Embassy Baghdad, medical operations in Iraq, and the Department's oversight of the WPS task order for Kirkuk and Mosul. We have also proposed to DOD OIG that we undertake a joint audit of transition execution in Iraq, including implementation of the Baghdad Master Plan. In Kabul, we plan to audit the WPS task order for the Kabul Embassy Security Force, contracts to build prisons, and the WPS task order for Herat and Mazari Sharif. For 2012, our Office of Inspections has planned inspections of the Office of the Coordinator for Counterterrorism and the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons. The Office of Audits is following up on its work in the region regarding treatment by contractors of third country nationals, and our Office of Investigations also is actively engaged on this issue. We will continue to provide the Department and Congress with a comprehensive spectrum of audits, inspections, and investigations of post-transition activity in Iraq and preparations for transition planning and operations in Afghanistan. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Tierney, and members of the subcommittee, thank you once again for the opportunity to appear today, and I am ready to answer your questions. Thank you. We will now recognize Mr. Carroll, the Acting Inspector General at USAID. Thank you, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney. Uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to describe our work uh, generally and specifically in Iraq and Afghanistan. Iraq and Afghanistan. If I could, I would like to begin by e explaining how we are structured, uh, uniquely structured, I would think, to provide oversight of AIDS programs around the world. Like the agency, the uh, OIG is a foreign affairs, foreign service organization, and more than, uh, than two-thirds of our auditors and investigators are career foreign service officers permanently assigned to USAID OIG. 
So that worldwide availability gives us a great deal of flexibility to put people where they need to be when they need to be. In addition to that, uh, even though we participate in the NSDD 38 process, by statute we are exempt from country staffing level ceilings. So while this has never been an issue and I don't think it ever will be, uh, we can put people where we need to put people regardless of what the situation is on the ground with, uh, with staffing, uh, staffing ceilings uh, in the different embassies. And again, that gives us a great deal of flexibility. And over the past eight years, uh, a couple of examples uh, are opening country offices in Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan, doubling the size of our staff in Pretoria, South Africa to oversee the Hyde Lantos money for AIDS and infectious diseases in sub-Saharan Africa and then opening a uh, satellite office, a smaller satellite office in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, to help the regional office in El Salvador oversee the uh, humanitarian assistance and reconstruction of post-earthquake post Haiti. So I think that regardless of whether it is a contingency operation or just a standard uh, agency USAID operation, I, I think we are uniquely situated to, uh, to do that work, to do the oversight work. In Iraq, we, we, had, uh, we started our oversight in 2003 uh, with long-term TDYs, and then when the embassy got up and running and the, uh, and the aid mission got up and running, uh, we established an office of seven auditors and two investigators. So we have been there pretty much with uh, SIGER right, right from the beginning and will continue to be there. As the trajectory on the agency's programs in Iraq uh, are sort of leveling off to a traditional country office uh, mission operation at about $270 million for 13. We are going to reduce the size of the staff to two auditors, two investigators, move the additional people over to Egypt, where our regional office is, and then provide, Iraq, uh, provide oversight of Iraq from, from Egypt and from uh, Iraq. In Afghanistan, we developed a little bit differently. Clearly, the, uh, the infrastructure uh, wasn't available early on, so we were doing most of our work from the Philippines. We created a virtual country office in the Philippines, and we were literally on the ground full time in Afghanistan with auditors and investigators uh, doing the work. But as, as the program increased in scope and complexity, uh, we, we worked out with the embassy to put an office there. And now we have seven auditors, U.S. direct hire auditors, four uh, Foreign Service national auditors. We have four American U.S. direct hire investigators one foreign national investigator, and we are going to probably put on one more foreign national investigator. So we are committed uh, both to Iraq and to Afghanistan in providing audit oversight and uh, investigative oversight of AIDS programs uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, so with, with that, I, uh, I uh, would be appreciate that you. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you, and I uh, would uh, welcome any questions you might have about our oversight, opportunity, our oversight activity and the opportunities to improve that going forward. Thank you. We will now recognize the Honorable Stuart Bowen, who is the Special Inspector General for the Iraq Reconstruction. Thank you, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, members of the Committee, for the opportunity to appear before you again and address our oversight work in Iraq and also to take up uh, the issue of improving oversight in contingency operations. I just returned two weeks ago from my 31st trip to Iraq over the last eight years met uh, with my 10 auditors and investigators while I was there, and we are busy still addressing significant issues regarding the substantial U.S. funds uh, being expended in Iraq. It is true, the military is departing the end of this month. Our footprint is shrinking, but billions of dollars in taxpayer money is still being spent, and that, though, that money requires firm and effective oversight uh, for the coming year and the years thereafter. Uh, on Monday, we appeared before the House Committee on Foreign Affairs to address the largest expenditure planned for next year by the State Department, and that is the billion dollars for the police development program. Real questions raised about the preparation for that. Much work remains to be done to ensure that it can succeed. While I was in Iraq, I met with Ambassador Jeffrey, uh, our Ambassador to Iraq, and Ambassador Sisson, who is in charge of the police development program, and they concurred with our findings and are taking action vigorously to implement them. Uh, however, I remain concerned about a couple of matters that, that occurred over the last month regarding our presence there, and one is an, a review process that the State Department has implemented to require us to vet the information that we normally get for our quarterly reports back through offices uh, here in Washington, which will 
impede our responsiveness. You've, you've come to rely on our quarterly reports for, the, for quick truth on what's going on in Iraq, and we want to maintain that capacity. Uh, we hope that we can overcome that limitation. And there's also been an investigation problem that, that I identify in my statement that, that's relative to our capacity to get information and carry out investigations. These raise continuing concerns about our capacity to execute effective oversight in Iraq. But I also want to address uh, the government's capacity to execute effective oversight in contingency operations. The, the Wartime Commission, in its final report uh, a few months ago, rightly recognized uh, that the United States can improve its ability to oversee, oversee contingency operations, recommending the creation of a Special Inspector General's Office. In other words, permanizing what's, what we have been doing, what, what my colleague Mr. Trent and his staff are doing in Afghanistan. And, and I concur with their recommendation uh, because uh, it will provide f funds, savings of money in Iraq. That's, that's, the, that's the bottom line. In Iraq, Afghanistan, and all overseas contingencies uh, going forward, the Special Inspector General for Overseas Contingencies would save taxpayer dollars. We have done that in Iraq. It is being done in Afghanistan. It would be done in future contingency operations. Let me take very quickly the three objections to it uh, that have been raised. One. It would be a layer uh, of additional oversight. The opposite is true. The experience of SIGR in Iraq has been that we have coalesced and focused oversight uh, of the Iraq Reconstruction uh, uh, mission and, as a result, have generated more effective work, more output uh, work that, that would have been more difficult to accomplish if there had been three, four, five Inspector General's offices operating tandem. Also, we, we created the Iraq Inspector General Council, and as Mr. Carroll pointed out, we worked very closely with aid from the beginning and with State and with, with DOD over time through that process to generate better work. Uh, it has been a, an effective catalyst to synergize oversight efforts uh, in country, not a layer. Second, uh, the Special Inspector General for Overseas Contingencies would not sit fallow, as some have said, uh, awaiting a contingency to happen. First of all, all you need to know is we have been in one of some form or another every year but two since 1980. Uh, the last 10 years, we have been in the two largest in our history, in Afghanistan and Iraq. There, there is no doubt that, that the, the use of this office would be regular and necessary and, again, would generate savings of funds. And, and finally, uh, and this is the most important thing, would the expenses or the costs of this Special Inspector General Office be more or less than, than the current system that is used? And the answer is less. This could, we have submitted a budget. It, it could operate on an effective, very uh, limited uh, amount uh, for, the, for the time necessary until contingencies occurred and then would be directed by the Congress at the Congress's call uh, to oversight, to provide oversight in contingencies as they arise. It would be a tool for the Congress, a boon to the taxpayers, and save money in these times of, of, of $15 trillion debt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Bowen. I, I know we will have some more uh, lively discussion about the, this, uh, this proposal as well. I uh, will now recognize Mr. Trent, who is the Acting Inspector General uh, for in our Afghanistan Reconstruction. Uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Trent, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Tierney, and members of the committee. I am pleased to be here with my colleagues today to discuss ways to strengthen oversight of reconstruction in Afghanistan. As you know, the President has requested more than $18 billion in the FY 2012 budget to assist Afghanistan. If approved, this will bring total appropriations to $90 billion, which is the largest rebuilding effort since the Marshall Plan. Congress created SIGAR in 2008 to provide oversight for this significant investment. Since then, our auditors and investigators have had a positive impact on the reconstruction effort. We have issued 49 audit reports and made 149 recommendations that have led to greater accountability and improvements in contracting and program management. Just this year, our auditors have identified nearly $70 million in funds that should be returned to the U.S. Government. SIGAR investigators have played an important role in both detecting and deterring fraud. Their work has resulted in the recent successful prosecution of the largest bribery case to date from Afghanistan. This year, they produced $51 million in fines, penalties, forfeitures, seizures, and savings. However, I believe SICAR can and must do more to strengthen oversight during this critical transition period in Afghanistan. So we are taking aggressive steps to focus our audit and investigative work 
on the most critical areas of the reconstruction effort. We have developed a fiscal year 2012 audit plan that identifies five critical areas to successful Afghanistan reconstruction. They are private security contractors, Afghan governance capacity and sustainability, contracting, program results and evaluations, fraud detection and mitigation. We have also added inspections to provide timely assessments of infrastructure projects. These rapid reviews will verify if the work was performed correctly and achieved intended outcomes. Most importantly, this work can help determine if projects are sustainable. We are also adding a series of audits to examine contract expenditures. These audits will allow us to more accurately assess whether the U.S. government has been billed properly. Along with our sister oversight agencies, we consistently coordinate to avoid duplicating each other's work. However, we know that we need a more comprehensive and targeted approach. Therefore, along with our colleagues, we are developing a strategic framework to guide the IG community's work in Afghanistan reconstruction. We intend to identify the issues most important to lawmakers and policymakers and use these issues to drive the results of the IG community's work. Cigar hosted the first meeting of this effort last week. Finally, Cigar is taking a leadership role in holding contractors accountable in Afghanistan. We are expanding our investigative presence in Afghanistan to build criminal cases. We have 111 ongoing criminal investigations, 68 of which involve contract and procurement fraud. Criminal and civil legal proceedings, however, can take substantial periods of time. So Cigar has also enhanced its suspension and debarment program to address the need for more timely and targeted actions. Cigar is currently on track to make approximately 80 suspension and debarment referrals by the end of this year. Cigar is taking important steps to enhance oversight. However, implementing agencies also have a responsibility to strengthen oversight of their own operations. During my recent trip to Afghanistan, I met with high-level U.S. civilian and military officials to discuss what steps they are taking to improve contract and program management. I will continue to engage in these important discussions, which also help to better target Cigar's work. Let me conclude by saying that we have listened closely to this committee's thoughtful questions about oversight, and we are heeding your concerns. The Congress has provided enormous resources for Afghanistan reconstruction in a difficult budgetary environment. At Cigar, we are committed to ensuring that our oversight not only protects this historic investment, but helps U.S. implementing agents, agencies produce better results. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving Cigar the opportunity to appear this morning. Thank you, and thank you all for your service and your commitment. I now like to recognize myself for five minutes, and Mr. Hadell, we we'll start with you. Um, the Defense Contracting Auditing Agency, I know, is a little bit outside of your lane, uh, but I'd appreciate it if you would offer a perspective. The, the Commission on Wartime Contracting it indicated that there were some 56,000 56, uh, contracts behind in terms of auditing these contracts. Why is that? How can that be? How, how is it that DOD can be so far behind in, in this? Mr. Chairman. It, you're, sorry, your microphone, please. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, my office has actually done a lot of work with respect to uh, DCAA. Um, I would just say generally, first off, that I think they, they probably are under-resourced and need, uh, need help in that respect. But historically, uh, DCAA has been a very challenged organization. They do a tremendous amount of work for a lot of agencies, not just inside the Def Department of Defense, but outside the Department of Defense. In the last three to four years, the DCAA has undergone um, some uh, sweeping changes as a result of some fairly significant criticisms of their leadership, of their processes, and, and, and not meeting expectations. As a result of that, it has new leadership today with Pat Fitzgerald, who was the Director of Army Audit. And Pat has taken on a gigantic job. And with the work that my office has done to try and help them identify vulnerabilities in their management, in their processes, uh, and how to be an effective organization, for the last two years, their, their focus has been, and I, this is Gordon Hedell talking, more internal than external. So while under ideal circumstances, they would have been focusing outward, doing great work, doing lots of audits, 
with very experienced and good leadership, they have had to focus inward to correct management deficiencies and vulnerabilities. I think that is partially a result of this backlog in, in audits, now, but not uh, entirely. And, and my understanding is I mean, we have been participating in a lot of, lot of wars and spending a lot of money and a lot of resources. Right. As that expenditure has gone up, uh, help me understand what is happening with the actual auditors themselves, because you have been appropriated more money. Absolutely. In fact, I have been a very fortunate organization. In the last three to four years, the, the, the DOD uh, Office of Inspector General has been plussed up some $87 million, Mr. Chairman. Um, I doubt that any other IG can say that, so I am very fortunate. The Congress uh, has uh, uh, been very supportive of me. And, and for that matter, so has the de Department of Defense. But have you been spending the, that money? No. The, the, it's a, the, the problem there is that the, the, the budget, the $87 million in plus-ups that I have received, have not been annualized. And what that means is that although I am very fortunate to get these plus-ups, I am not able to use that money to, to hire permanent staff. So I can hire contractors. I can. I can uh, do other things with that money, but I cannot, because, because it is not being annualized by the Department, um, I cannot run the risk of hiring people and then having to riff them the following year for fear that I don't have enough money in my budget to pay them. And it's, I, a, it's a problem. It doesn't uh, mean of that $87 million that you have gotten, how much, have you, how much did you actually spend? Well, we, we have spent almost all of it because um, but you are hiring outside but contractors we, to do? Yes, sir. We are hiring outside contractors. Um, we are we're, we're creatively doing work that is positive and, and meets the needs of, of uh, both the Congress and the Department of the American people. But, for instance, you know, there, one of the, one, in the early 2000s, um, there are two things that happened that have, that have come to haunt us today. One is that while we sent our military forces into Southwest Asia to fight two wars, uh, there, there was a mistaken belief by the civil, many of the civilian agencies that they could fight those two wars in the continental United States, my own organization being one of those. And it wasn't until three or four years ago that we came to the realization you cannot do that. You, you must be present and you have to have the people uh, in place. You have to have the footprint. The second thing that happened is that the Department of Defense's budget du doubled to about $650 billion. And at the same time, the contract uh, acquisition and contract management workforce, in fact, was reduced in size, meaning that we lack thousands and thousands of needed contracting specialists that are th not there to oversight these contracts that are not there to raise their hand and say, stop the assembly line. We are spending money that we are not watching. We are not surveilling it. So those are two major issues. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I think this highlights a, a multi-billion dollar challenge and problem that, uh, that we certainly need to address and fix, because I think there is a, a definite need the, that is pervasive in the Congress, both the House and the Senate, to make sure that these types of functions are in place. But the way that the money is appropriated is obviously uh, falling short and failing. Uh, I have overstated my time. I will now recognize the ranking member, um, uh, Mr. Tierney from Massachusetts, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hedell, I think you, you hit one major problem right on the head in the last part. I think we have seriously hollowed out a lot of our agencies in terms of keeping at least the personnel on board to oversee and to, um, to manage contracts on that. We find that repeatedly every time we have a hearing on that respect. And if we are going to contract out, which is not always a good idea, but if we are going to do it, then at least we have to keep on board enough people to sort of manage these things well for everybody's benefit. In your report, Mr. Hedell, on the sub, uh, subsistence prime vendor contract for Afghanistan, mm -hmm. you found that, that while Supreme Group provided the products that were required by the contract, the Defense Logistics Agency failed to provide sufficient oversight of contract cost and performance. Specifically, you found that the agency overpaid the vendor nearly $100 million in transportation costs, paid the vendor $455 million to airlift fresh fruits and vegetables without properly incorporating those requirements into the contract, and allowed Supreme to bill the Army over $50 million in costs for the wrong appropriation year. 
What recourse uh, do you have as Inspector General uh, when the agency fails to properly manage a contract and that failure leads to hundreds of millions of dollars in losses to the taxpayer? Well, thank you, uh, uh, Congressman Tierney. I appreciate the question. I, I can, I mean, obviously this is an example of just about how bad it can get. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly this happened. Um, this contract was created back in 2005. It wasn't a well-designed, well-thought-out uh, contract, uh, probably like many contracts during that period. Uh, consequently, we have spent some $3 billion on this contract. And as you said, we, we, we overpaid the prime vendor $98, $98 million in transportation costs. We overpaid them $25.9 million in triwall costs, the boxing corrugated boxes and so on, and as you indicated, $455 million in services to airlift fruit and vegetables from the United Arab Emirates into Afghanistan without even including that in the contract. All of that is a result of not planning properly and using a contract, uh, designing a contract that was not in the best interests of the American people. Now, we have gone, my organization, gone to the Defense Logistics Agency, and we have told them we want that money back. And the Defense Logistics Agency agrees with us. And they, uh, uh, beginning in October, they began, this past October of 11, they began to make efforts to determine, first of all, what are the fair and reasonable prices that should have been charged. Imagine that. A contract created in 2005 and now, in December of 2011, we are just now determining what should have been the reasonable and fair prices to pay. Okay, but they have agreed, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, to do that. And they are currently in face-to-face -face no negotiations with Supreme. And the pro timeline projection for a resolution on this, and I would never hold my breath and think we will get, get it all back. But a resolution for this is actually scheduled for December 9th this week. So I'm hopeful that when we talk again, that I can say to you, we've been able to recover a great deal of those funds. Thanks, well, Mr. Trent. You, you recall all of that from the contracts that we looked at on the trucking situation in Afghanistan. The the lack of vision, or you know, uh, ability to look into the contracts, the subcontracts, and the finer detail of those were just never written into the contracts to begin with. Uh, so, Mr. Bowen, tell me, would a uh, Special Inspector General for Contingency Operations help alleviate this problem of, of sending people in, uh, getting to part way down the road before you realize all these mistakes are happening? There is no doubt about that for three reasons. One, uh, there will be focus and preparation in place at the time a contingency begins for a Special Inspector General to deploy. Two, there will be a commitment to deployment. As, as my friend Mr. Hadell pointed out, there, there was a challenge, I think, at at DOD, but also with the other IGs in, in moving forward and being there to do the oversight. One of the lessons from SIGUR is that you have to be there to do the work. Uh, a Special Inspector General's office would be hiring people who know that when they sign on, they are going to go and deploy and carry out oversight in a conflict zone. And finally, and, and this is a good example of, of, of how a, a SIGOCO could make a difference, cross-agency jurisdiction something unique to a special IG that the institutional IGs don't have. That means I can dig in to problems like this and find out if it's DOD money being wasted or state money or aid money, however uh, that money may, may be going away, we can get to it and get to it faster and thus save it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I will recognize myself now for five minutes. And um, Mr. Trent. The Obama administration has increased its direct assistance to the Afghan government from approximately $665 million in FY09 to roughly $2 billion in FY10. Uh, this program is designed to provide U.S. taxpayer money directly to the Karzai government for the purpose of carrying out reconstruction projects. Is it logical to assume that one of the most corrupt governments in the world will actually have proper stewardship of U.S. taxpayer money? It's a very good question, Congressman. Mm -hmm. 
Um, CIGAR has conducted a number of audits and has a number of audits planned in the um, capacity development areas of the various ministries, MOD, MOI, on the coming year, ARTF in the past. Uh, looking at, uh, among other things, in those the capacity of the Afghan government to administer Afghan direct funds. Um, we have a significant and serious challenge, as you point out, with corruption in the Karzai government in Afghanistan. Um, the efforts um, with corruption in Afghanistan are, are uh, almost insurmountable. Uh, clearly, we need more of a concerted will by the government there and we need a much stronger um, and robust criminal justice system, which they simply don't have. So um, we're doing what we can to monitor those funds, and we will continue to do that. Um, I can't say if I'm optimistic or not with regard to the corruption uh, and, and uh, control of those funds. Well, what should we be doing? I mean, if you're not confident, um, I, I'm not confident either. And uh, what, what should we be doing? Because you, you, you said something about how we need a more robust criminal system. Well, they don't have one. They don't have the proper procedures. They don't have the proper oversight uh, people. So, so what should we be doing? Well, I, I believe we're doing about all we can. I mean, we need to continue with our rule of law efforts there. Uh, we, need, uh, we, we can't give up on that, notwithstanding the... Uh, mm -hmm the corruption uh, walls that we've encountered with that. Uh, we have to continue to bring pressure wherever possible on uh, the government itself to show uh, a concerted effort uh, in, in the area of corruption and prosecute some of their own ministers. We have to continue to conduct the audits and uh, continue to work on the investigative side with uh, the Afghan authorities that we can work with to pursue Afghan violators. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Bowen. Um, Right now, the police development program is the administration's largest uh, foreign aid program for Iraq going forward. And there's some evidence that the Iraqis don't even want this program. So have you or your staff asked the Iraqi police forces if they need the $500 million a year program that the Obama administration is planning to spend on the police department development program? Uh, yes, Mr. Labrador, we have. And we reported on that in our last quarterly, noting that the senior official at the Ministry of Interior, uh, Senior Deputy Minister al uh said, quote, uh, he didn't see any real benefit uh, from the police development program, unquote. Uh, I addressed that with him uh, when I was in Iraq a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him, did you mean what you said? And, he, and his response was, well, we welcome support, any support that the, that the American government will provide us. However, my statements as quoted uh, in your recent quarterly, are still posted on my website. So, so why is the administration still spending $500 million a year to provide this program? Uh, there is a belief that, the, that security uh, continues to be a challenging uh, issue in Iraq, a well-founded belief, I might add, given the events of this week. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, killings of pilgrims again uh, on the way to Najaf uh, uh, on the eve of Ashra. Uh, the, the focus, though, on trying to address those, those problems has been uh, a, a widely scattered, high-level uh, training program involving about 150 police trainers uh, who, are, who, as we've seen again this week, are going to have a very difficult time moving about the country. So what other problems have you found with the police development program, if any? Several. Uh, well, Mr. Labrador, we pointed out in our audit that one, Iraqi buy-in, something the Congress requires from Iraq by law, that is a contribution of 50 percent to such programs, has not been secured in writing or, in fact, by any other means. Uh, that, that's of great concern, especially for a, a ministry that has a budget of over $6 billion, a, a uh, government that just approved uh, notionally a $100 billion budget for next year. Uh, it's not Afghanistan. You know, this is a country that, that has significant wealth, should be able to contribute, um, but has not been forced to do so in a, in a program as crucial as this. I, I know I've run out of time, but Mr. Geisel, do, do you have some comments on this? And well, uh, of course, first of all, I, I'm not going to uh, second-guess my, my friend and, and colleague on what uh, his people found. And, uh, of course, the people you need to bring up here are the people from the State Department to comment on what uh, he found. Uh, I do, I saw that uh, 
uh, the Department published a, a document, a 21-page document that includes goals and measures of performance for the police development program, but it's, it's my friend's baby, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, give, uh, I will give five minutes now to Mr. Welch from Vermont. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Labrador. I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for the terrific work that you are doing. Uh, a lot of the situations that you are uncovering just reflect the impossible expectations oftentimes that Congress has. And if it were as easy as writing a check and having the police force in Iraq and Afghanistan be established, it would be no problem. And against, uh, I think, our better judgment, sometimes we spend this money and then, uh, surprise, surprise, you tell us that it's, a lot of it is being wasted. Uh, but I really do applaud uh, the work that you are doing. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be introducing legislation that does trigger disbarment, uh, uh, debarment proceedings for contractors that are convicted of violating the bribery provisions of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And there is some debate uh, between uh, my office and the Attorney General's office as to uh, how strict that should be. Uh, that is a very critical tool uh, for you. Uh, my view is that uh, that debarment authority hasn't been adequately exercised uh, in our war zones. Uh, and I, let me ask you, Inspector General Trent. Uh, I know that CIGAR has, does have robust suspension and debarment programs, but do you believe that DOD, USAID, and State are adequately and appropriately using uh, the authority in Iraq and Afghanistan? And if not, what are the barriers to its use, and how can we work through them? Uh, to ensure the taxpayer dollars are not getting ripped off. Well, Congressman, yeah, yes, we do. We do have, I believe, an, an, an aggressive and, and somewhat effective uh, suspension and debarment program in Cigar, um, and and I'm uh, somewhat aware of your your pending legislation on the FCPA issue. Uh, with regard to my my colleagues' use of suspension and debarments, I, I think I mean suspension and debarments has been a, a tool available to. Um, Contracting authorities, acquisition authorities, and, and, and inspector generals, as far as their proposals uh, for some time. Um, in, in my um, experiences in the last several years in, in Southwest Asia, I felt that, that we could, we could uh, increase uh, that use. And when I came to Cigar, I, I took steps to do that. Um, but so it is an effective tool and should be used. Congressman, I believe it is a very effective tool, and, and I believe it is. Uh, in the Afghanistan case, it's a, it's a tool both in terms of corruption and in contract uh, management and, and implementation. Okay. Uh, let, let me ask you one more question because I don't have too much time. I just got back from uh, uh, Afghanistan, and uh, one of the people that we met with was from the uh, from the Attorney General's office, and he was in the anti-corruption unit, and th they were there training uh, Afghan civil servants about how to detect corruption. And when I asked the Attorney General, how is it going? Mm -hmm. He said, well, we had to end the program. And I said, why is that? And he says, because when we were teaching them how to detect it, they were using the information to do it. So <laughs> that's, that's a real challenge uh, that we face. But w when we s visited the commanders in, in Helmand and uh, in, uh, Kandahar, one of the things they were promoting was uh, uh, the, the development of the Kajaki hydroelectric dam, which would cost about $475 million. And the benefits of it are obvious if it could be implemented. It would provide hydroelectric power, electricity, maybe some irrigation. But the question, it's not coming out of their budget. It would be in a supplemental expenditure. So it's not like the military would be taking that out of their ability to do their job. It would come from somewhere else. So I was a little bit skeptical because it's easy to promote the expenditure of somebody else's money. But bottom line, uh, that's a conflict zone and significant questions about whether this could be done. And uh, my question to you is, uh, does it make sense at this point to ask the taxpayers to spend $475 million on a, uh, on a hydroelectric project that would have extensive transmission lines, all of which would be uh, easily attackable uh, by insurgents? Or does it make sense to put that on hold? Congressman Cigar has not looked specifically at the Kajaki Dam or, or conducted an audit on that. I'm, I believe my colleague at uh, USAID has done some work in that area. Uh, we have looked at the um, uh, Kabul power plant and the energy sector with audits, but specifically on Kajaki Dam, we haven't. 
So I would try to punt that to my uh, colleague at USAID, I believe, who's done some work in that area. Uh, yes, sir. I, I'm running on the edge of time here, but with the indulgence of the chairman. Well, Mr. Welsh, oh. all right. Thank you. I, I think you initially asked a, a, a political or administrative uh, administration question about the the uh, the utility of going forward with the program when you consider the. Uh, the difficult environment in which it would be implemented. We have done a couple of audits, and in fact, I've been talking to Ambassador Crocker this week. It seems to be a priority of, of, of the embassy and, and the government to move forward with that. Uh, it looks like, the, according to Ambassador Crocker, the Army Corps of Engineers is going to undertake a, a major part of the program, and AID would, would also be responsible for uh, doing some work at the Kajaki Dam. So, primarily, the problem up there has been security, and, and, and now it is getting very difficult to get contractors to even bid on the work uh, when you consider the, the security uh, situation up there. So overall, is, is, is the power sector an important sector? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, but it is a very difficult environment to work in up there. Thank you. Uh, I will now give five minutes to Mr. Yarmuth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank all of you for your testimony and appreciate the work you do also. We now face, because of um, the debt ceiling deal that we did, a possible sequester of funds, and a large amount of that sequester of funds in 20, beginning in 2013 would come from the Defense Department. Secretary Panetta has said that such a, a cut as, as projected under the sequester process would be devastating to the Defense Department and our security. And yet we listen to these um, stories and we have talked about the essentially the inability to get a handle on it and re on these contracting, uh, these contracts in real time. How are we going to know, Mr. Hedell, if the sequester is really going to have an impact on defense when we don't really have a, a grasp on the hundreds of millions and billions of dollars we are spending now. Although I can't con uh, comment on, on the sequester, uh, Congressman Yarmouth, I can tell you that in the last three or four years I have seen significant progress in the Inspector General community in terms of its oversight. And I have also seen progress with respect to the way the uh, commanders, in fact, I just got back from uh, Afghanistan myself, and I have I've seen progress in terms of the approach that we are taking. For instance, um, this year, one of the, one of the things that we uh, started doing was assisting the uh, MOD and the MOI, Ministers of Defense and Interior, with respect to core uh, capabilities, meaning their ability to manage government, something we had not done before, so that, so that we have a way of teaching them how to do it and then going back and making sure that they are accountable. And so we are creating systems and processes. I can't assure you that that is going to work, but it is something we should have done before. The other thing, the Inspector General community itself, which is very as a significant tool in overcoming so many of the challenges. Four years ago, the statement that if you have seen one IG, you have seen one IG was really true. Today it is not true. Once the um, amendment to the Inspector General Act was passed a few years ago, what has happened is similar to what has happened in law enforcement. All of the big things now are done in task forces, they are done in teams, where you have IGs now getting together to solve a common problem. You have law enforcement agencies working on task forces to address uh, corruption. Um, and by the way, you mentioned, um, uh, or it was mentioned earlier, uh, the, the use of tools such as debarment. Well, that is a great tool, uh, but you have to realize that what happens is when we debar a company in Afghanistan, what happens is they just go back and change their name and reapply and get a new contract. That happens over and over again. So 
The answer isn't simply debarment, and obviously we can't, we, we've had no, almost no success in prosecuting, using the, the prosecuting attorney in Afghanistan. So we, we have to find ways to influence the leadership to do the right things. And I think with the oversight community, we've done that. Again, I can't, I can't comment on what, what the, sequest the, the sequestering of funds might amount to. I know this no, department I'm, is working hard to accomplish. I'm more missions. interested in the overall process uh, and not, obviously this is broader than just uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. It is. But you know, one of the things that has occurred to me recently is we have a world that's moving at 80 miles an hour and we have a government that is structured to run at 20 miles an hour and it's taken us this long in Iraq and Afghanistan to even get, begin to get a handle on this. I mean, do we have, it seems to me we have a fundamental structural problem that we don't know how to keep up with the, we, the situations we find ourselves we, in. We are habitually late. And I said that earlier in my testimony. When we had four military services fighting in Southwest Asia in 01 and then in 03, the civilian agencies were, quote, fighting that war back here in the continental United States. It took us until 2007 or 08 to realize you cannot successfully fight a war unless everyone's involved, civilian agencies, and that we're ahead. It's taken us now three or four years to get there. But I think, sir, I think we're getting pretty much closer to getting where we need to be. Thank you. I don't have an answer to, to no, I know, <laughs> the problem. I I, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to give myself now uh, five minutes, and I'm going to follow up actually on those questions. One of the things that's most frustrating to me as a freshman here in Congress is that there are some things that both sides agree on that we need to, we need to be working on, and, and we, yet we're not doing them. I, I look at the Oversight Committee. I, here, I don't think there's a lot of difference. There might be some, some small differences between the two sides, but it seems like we can identify things like the 500 billion dollars that we're going to spend on Iraq, you know, Iraq police force that, that they don't even want. That we, we should be finding things in common that we could be saving on. I want, if, if we could put on that transparency here on President Obama, and I'm not saying this, I'm not using this to embarrass anybody, but President Obama has said on his website that he's committed to making his administration the most open and transparent in history. He wants a window for all Americans into the business of the government, and that's something that I want. I actually agree with him uh, on, on this issue. But yet, this panel is representing the IG offices principally responsible for overseeing taxpayer money in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as of January 4th of next year, four of the five offices will not have an IG. Uh, I'm concerned about that. Now, uh, I, I want everybody to comment. Do you know whether the President has nominated anyone to fill these vacancies? If so, who has been no nominated? Have you made any recomm recommendations? And do you think the absence of permanent IGs will, will actually harm our efforts in, in oversight? Okay. And, and anyone can take this uh, question. I, I certainly would like to comment. Yeah. Uh, number one, I don't know the names, uh, Congressman Labrador, of anyone that might have been nominated or who is being considered to be nominated. Um, number two, I can tell you that the, 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 the confirmation, the nomination and confirmation process that we have uh, is cumbersome and slow, and it has an adverse impact on the, on the leadership of these organizations. Number three, when I took over as the uh, acting inspector general in July of 2008, the DOD IG had, uh, at the very top, had been vacant. For so many years, over the past 10, 12 years, you can't imagine. You, and so to run an organization using an acting inspector general as the leader is foolhardy. You can do it for a few months, but you cannot succeed over years and decades. And that is what has happened. Does anybody know why that has happened? Is, is there any, any reason why, which seems like both sides would agree that we need a, a, a robust IG uh, in, in all of these agencies. Does anybody have any comments on that? Mr. Carroll? Hmm. I, I can't comment on what the White House is doing, but I just want to assure you on, be, on behalf of the USAID OIG hmm. that one of the great things about working for Don Gambatisa was it was truly a partnership between him and I. So as I moved into the acting role, 
other than the fact that it is a bit of a workload issue for me, the work goes on and the leadership philosophy continues. And so I just want to assure the subcommittee that there will be no degradation in our effectiveness uh, or what our work is going to be for as long as it takes for the President to make a decision on the 8IG job. Okay. Now, I know that uh, Mr. Bowen has been a staunch advocate of, of the Sogoko. Uh, is that something that the rest of the panel agrees that is necessary? Do you think it is not necessary? If, if, if you don't think it is necessary, why, Ms. Mr. Geisel? Well, I didn't volunteer, but I will still be okay. happy to <laughs> tell you what I think. I was volunteering here. <laughs> <laughs> you look so, so willing to answer this question. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, in his testimony, uh, 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 the written testimony especially, uh, uh, my colleague uh, made some very good points. Uh, and uh, one of the key points is that uh, the concept of Sogoko, and for that matter his own office, has had a wonderful advantage, and that is that they have hiring authorities uh, and they had generous funding that the statutory IGs uh, didn't have. Uh, Sigoko is one way to approach it. Another way uh, to approach uh, that issue is to give us, the statutory IGs, uh, those same authorities and robust funding. Uh, now, I can't complain about funding because since I came uh, to uh, the Department in 2008, uh, Congress has plussed us up marvelously. Uh, but those hiring authorities, it would make a real difference. And I agree with what, what he said. Those, are, those authorities are crucial to doing the kind of job that you would like us to do. You know, what concerns me about the idea is that it is something that we do here in Washington all the time. Something isn't working. And what we end up doing is creating a whole new agency or a whole new department instead of giving the authority to the people that are already in charge of doing it and giving them the responsibility. It seems like we do this in all, all of our agencies. And then what we create is just another uh, layer of, of administration and responsibility. So I just wish we could find a way to actually use the existing people that we have right now, the existing authorities, instead of trying to create new new agency. But I, I do understand his concern, I, and I, I think we all share the concern that we want we should be saving taxpayer money for, for the American people, and there are ways that we can agree to do it, and we just need to get it done. Anyway, I will now uh, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Tierney. Timing's perfect on that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's explore this a little bit. I mean, I think it's a healthy debate, and, uh, and I appreciate everybody's position on that. The Sogoko Consmet, the Special Inspector General for uh, Contingency Operations, uh, would not be duplicative if it is carried out in the way that the legislation is, is drafted and the way it is intended. Uh, currently, there is nobody responsible for contingency operations unless they are specially appointed. They are appointed on a case-by-case -case situation as and when it arises and, and the Congress decides to uh, implement. And all of the existing inspectors generals have a handful doing what they are doing within their respective agencies. So if you are Mr. Hedell, he's never had a moment when he hasn't had enough to do. <laughs> uh, the same goes Thank Mr. Geisel, the same goes Mr. Tra I mean, Mr. Carroll, I mean, their hands are full doing things within uh, the area of their lane uh, on that, and I suspect they could be busy for as long as, uh, as they wanted to keep the position. So, Mr. Bowen, let, let's allow you to do some testifying here on that. Is, you know, the Sogoko concept would be different in what ways, uh, would be non-duplicative in what ways, uh, and what is the problem it solves to get over uh, Mr. Labrador's uh, problem? You mentioned in your first testimony. I don't think Mr. Labrador was here, so let's reiterate right. it and show it, because I think it's healthy to know this. I think it's instructive. Yes, Mr. Tierney. First and foremost, uh, Sogoko would be cross-jurisdictional. Right. Uh, as hard as the Congress might try, as much as, the, uh, as my friends my fellow and fellow IGs uh, would like, they, they have to stay within their stovepipe to do their oversight, which means each of them have to be present. As, as, as my friend Gordon had all noted, in-country uh, carrying out oversight. But frequently, as we have learned in Iraq, as we see in Afghanistan, programs merge money. And when they merge money, you are going to ultimately have different IGs attacking it uh, or perhaps no one addressing it because of that merger. Sogoko would allow that, that cross-jurisdictional power. Second, it would be the primary mission of Sogoko to carry out this oversight. We know that had Sogoko existed in 2003, we would have averted the waste of billions of dollars. We know that had Cigar existed in 2002, 
we would have averted the waste of billions of dollars because of the aggressive presence of investigation and audit on the ground that would have been there. Third, you, you would have mem uh, a staff that when they sign up, they sign up to go to a conflict zone. That is not something that, that my friends and colleagues can require of their staff now. They can't say, hey, you are going to be going to war zone to do oversight. And that was a problem, frankly, in, in 2005, 2006, 2007, getting people to volunteer to go to Iraq, which was a very dangerous place, still is, Afghanistan is today. So, and, and finally, as I said in my testimony, this would save money. That is the watchword for this era. Uh, uh, th this is the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. The, the latter rubric should be ap applied when it can be applied in a money-saving way. Sogoco would be one of those ways. Thank you. you know, and I just remind my colleague that you know, all of these different agencies, inspectors generals for their respective agencies and departments, are busy all the time. So you have a contingency operation, all of a sudden now you have to somehow ramp up uh, and try to do all the things you are doing that are consuming all of your time and go over to this other area. So rather than being duplicative, you are actually focusing another inspector general on a much needed area to do that work and to be constantly available in order to, uh, to achieve it uh, and to get it done. Uh, and I think that is uh, that's an instructive part of that. Uh, there are other issues that you raised, but I think Mr. Bowen has uh, sort of hit them on the head on that. And if I can move from that a little bit onto the sustainability of projects that my colleagues raised earlier, uh, the, the whole wartime contracting commission, uh, which, incidentally, we had to do legislation on to get over there because of the issues in uh, contingency contracting. We had to get people in there and start looking at why things weren't being uh, dredged out in the very beginning. Their final chapter sums up the whole issue on project sustainability by saying that the Commission sees no indication that Defense, State, and USAID are making adequate plans to ensure that host nations will be able to operate and maintain U.S.-funded projects on their own, nor are they taking sustainability risk into account when devising new projects or programs. Uh, just for the panel, do we find that still to be the case, uh, or are there things being done to have them include sustainability risks in their projects as they move forward, particularly in Iraq as we move out of that area, but in Afghanistan and elsewhere as well? Whoever might want to volunteer on that. As far as oversight of that question, in every one of our performance audits in Iraq and Afghanistan, we have an audit objective for sustainability. And to be honest, what we found to date is that it's it's sort of a mixed bag, and I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's a very successful picture historically or even moving forward. But but I th I think realistically, uh, to answer the question, yes, the agency is building in uh, sustainability in the design of their projects. But you're dealing with the Afghan government, particularly going forward here, and and that's going to be problematic. And we've been finding problems. Uh, with sustainability and in, in AIDS programs in Afghanistan. With unanimous consent for 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. So, the problem that we have with the Kabul power plant, uh, where they decided to spend some, what, $300 million of our taxpayer money on it, and then decided after it was all done that they could get electricity cheaper from Uzbekistan on that basis. Uh, do we know why that happened or what we missed on that, and have we corrected that? Uh, um, well, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why the, the, the embassy and, and AID decided to build that project and build it the way they did with diesel fuel that, that could or could not be shipped in and, and then decided to move in a different direction. I, I, the way it's been described now is that the Kabul power plant is a, a fallback to and a surge capacity to the larger infrastructure that they're, they're putting forward. So. I, I would say that, from a sustainability point of view, that that maybe wasn't well thought out. But but I think they've learned uh, since that time. Well, I, I think that'd be instructive. Do you know what the error was, and have you done something to put it in place that it won't be happening again? I think that's my charge to you, if you would, on that. I, I guess you're not prepared to answer it today, but I mean right. that's you can go back and find out just what happened. Uh, and this business about now it's a, it's a backup plan or something like that. That's just an excuse. All right, you and I both know that. I think everybody on the panel knows that they they messed up. They got something that they didn't bargain for, and now they're going to try to find some reason to tear for its existence on that. But we need to ask you to go back, uh, find out what went wrong, and put in place a plan to make sure it doesn't happen again. And then, if you would report to us what you've done, I'd appreciate that. I'll do that, Congressman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. I'll not now recognize Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, two of the recurring questions uh, about the expenditure of these monies is whether a) we have a reliable partner 
and b whether the security on the ground is adequate so that the work can actually be done. And both of those are huge impediments. And uh, I'm just going to, and it comes in a conflict to some extent with policy objectives. Where let's say in Afghanistan, there's a desire to build a civil society. And uh, Mr. Carroll, I'll ask you because your department uh, bears so much of the responsibility for the implementation of some of these projects. Is a predicate question that should be asked and answered by some appropriate authority whether a project has a reliable partner such that there can be a reasonable de degree of confidence that will be implemented. And I am thinking very much about the, uh, or pardon me, the Iraqi police training that Mr. Labrador was asking about. Uh, or is there a sufficient security situation so that the work can be done? That might uh, be relevant to something like the dam project. And if you lack either or both of those, does it make any sense under any circumstances uh, to do a Hail Mary pass on a major expenditure, uh, hoping that it will happen just because we would like it to happen? Well, AID, you are right. Their meat and potatoes is civil society, it is democracy and governments, it is health, it is education, it is all those programs. They do do reconstruction, and they have done reconstruction in Iraq, and they have done it to an extent in Afghanistan. And I, I think it wouldn't be news if I were to say that it's difficult to do development in, in the middle of a war, in the middle of hostilities. So it has been problematic, particularly on the reconstruction side, the infrastructure side. You know, Mr. Bowen and Mr. Trent have, have found that throughout Iraq and Afghanistan. You talk about reliable uh, partners, you ask about reliable partners. Aid historically has implemented their, their programs through. Uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, primarily, and a lot of those are U.S.-based. A lot of some international, uh, multinationals like the United Nations agencies and that sort of thing. So they are reliable, uh, reliable partners. Uh, aid is now moving in a direction toward uh, funding more development assistance through uh, Afghan ministries, and they have a process in place to do some capacity assessment of the systems in place and the. the the ministry's ability to do the work. And as they convince themselves or as the data uh, presents itself, uh, they move forward or not on their, on their programs. So I would say that for the traditional AID programs, uh, civil society, democracy and governments, health, education, that sort of thing, I think there are reliable partners. I think there is a willingness on the behalf of the, uh, on behalf of the, of the Afghan uh, people to, to, to make these things happen. Well, that, that, I'm going to interrupt you right there. See, that, that is a meaningless statement. The Afghan people, who are they? You know, you, do you know what I mean? I, mm -hmm. I, I, in, a, in a general sense, uh, the Afghan people are as desirous to have good things happen as we are. But there, there's not a structure. Uh, right. There's not a political implementation program. Uh, there's not sufficient security. Uh, you know, I've met contractors who are confined uh, to basically the embassy compound, and how do you manage a program? Right. It would be like Mr. Bowen trying to uh, have auditing all done about Iraq and Afghanistan, Mr. Trent in Afghanistan, uh, from uh, Capitol Hill. I mean, it just doesn't work. And I, you know, this is an enormous frustration for you, but I think there's an illusion that in, in Congress is the one that is primarily responsible, because we will del have the money go out under circumstances where there is no practical possibility that it will be well used, and then we will get angry at you when you report to us that, hey, a lot of money went missing. So there is a predicate question here. We probably should be asking it, but I am wondering whether some organization like AID might have to certify that for this project we have a reliable governmental partner. They, they do that. Or we have got sufficient security that it can be done. All right. I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists for being here, for taking your time, for the work you are doing, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.